Section 7 of Early Kings of Norway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine. Early Kings of Norway by Thomas Carlyle. Section 7. Chapter 10. Reign of King Olaf the Saint. Part 2. From a man who built so many churches, one on each battlefield where he had fought, to say nothing of the others, and who had in him such depths of real devotion and other fine cosmic quality, this does seem rather strong. But it is characteristic, withal, of the man, and perhaps of the times still more. In any case, it is an event worth now noting, the slain Jar Ulf and his connections being of importance in the history of Denmark and of England also. Ulf's wife was Astrid, sister of Knut, and their only child was Svein, styled afterwards Svein Astridson, when he became noted in the world. At this time a beardless youth, who, on the back of this tragedy, fled hastily to Sweden, where were friends of Ulf. After some ten years eclipse there, Knut and both his sons being now dead, Svein reappeared in Denmark under a new and eminent figure, Jarl of Denmark highest leechman to the then soaring there. Broke his oath to said sovereign, declared himself, Svein Estrithson, to be real king of Denmark, and, after much preliminary trouble and many beatings and disastrous flights to and fro, became in effect such, to the wonder of mankind, for he had not had one victory to cheer him on, or any good luck or merit that one sees, except that of surviving longer than some others. Nevertheless, he came to be the restorer, so-called, of Danish independence, sole remaining representative of Knut, or Knut's sister, of Forkbeard, Bluetooth, and Old Gorm, and ancestor of all the subsequent kings of Denmark for some four hundred years, himself coming, as we see, only by the distaff side, all of the sword or male side having died so soon. Early death, it has been observed, was the great Knut's allotment, and all his posterity as well. Fatal limit, had there been no others which we seen there were, to his becoming Charlemagne of the North, in any considerable degree. Jarl Ulf, as we have seen, had a sister, Guda by name, wife to Earl Godwin, Gudin Ulfnadsson, as Snorro calls him, a very memorable Englishman, whose son and hers, King Harald, Harald in English books, as the memorablest of all, these things ought to be better known to English antiquaries, and will perhaps be alluded to again. This pretty little victory or affront gained over Knut in Lumfjord was among the last successes of Olaf against that mighty man. Olaf, the skilful captain he was, need not have despaired to defend his Norway against Knut and all the world. But he learned henceforth, month by month ever more tragically, that his own people, seeing softer prospects under Knut, and in particular the chiefs of them, industriously bribed by Knut for years past, had fallen away from him, and that his means of defense were gone. Next summer Knut's grand fleet sailed, unopposed, along the coast of Norway, Knut summoning a thing every here and there, and in all of them meeting nothing but sky-high acclamation and acceptance. Olaf, with some twelve little ships, all he now had, lay quiet in some safe fjord, near Lindenais, what we now call the Nays, behind some little solitary isles on the southeast of Norway there, till triumphant Knut had streamed home again. Home to England again, sovereign of Norway now, with nephew Hakon appointed Jarl and vice-regent under him. This was the news Olaf met on venturing out, and that his worst anticipations were not beyond the sad truth all, or almost all, the chief bonders and men of weight in Norway had declared against him, and stood with triumphant Knut. Olaf, with his twelve poor ships, steered vigorously along the coast to collect money and force, if such could now anywhere be had. He himself was resolute to hold out and try. Sailing swiftly with a fair wind, morning cloudy with some showers, he passed the coast of Jederen, which was Erling Skjalgsson's country, when he got sure notice of an endless multitude of ships, warships, armed merchant ships, all kinds of shipping craft, 
down to fishermen's boats just getting under way against him, under the command of Erling Skjalgsson, the powerfulest of his subjects, once much a friend of Olaf's, but now gone against him to this length, thanks to Olaf's severity of justice, and Knut's abundance in gold and promises for years back. To that complexion had it come with Erling, sailing with this immense assemblage of the naval people and populace of Norway, to seize King Olaf and bring him to the great Knut, dead or alive. Erling had a grand new ship of his own, which far outsailed the general miscellany of rebel ships, and was visibly fast gaining distance on Olaf himself, who well understood what Erling's puzzle was, between the tail of his game, the miscellany of rebel ships, namely, that could not come up, and the head or general prize of the game, which was crowding all sail to get away. And Olaf took advantage of the same. "'Lower your sails,' said Olaf to his men, "'though we must go slower.' "'Ho oh, you, we have lost sight of them,' said Erling to his, and put on all his speed. Olaf going, soon after this, altogether invisible, behind a little island that he knew of, went into a certain fjord or bay, bay of Fungen on the maps, which he thought would suit him. Halt here, and get out your arms, said Olaf, and had not to wait long till Erling came bounding in, past the rocky promontory, and with astonishment beheld Olaf's fleet, of twelve with their battle-axes, and their grappling irons all in perfect readiness. These fell on him, the unready Erling, simultaneous like a cluster of angry bees, and in a few minutes cleared his ship of men altogether, except Erling himself. Nobody asked his life, nor probably would have got if he had. Only Erling still stood erect on a high place on the poop, fiercely defensive, and very difficult to get at. Could not be reached at all, says Snorro, except by spears or arrows, and these he warded off with untiring dexterity. No man in Norway, it was said, had ever defended himself so long alone against many. An almost invincible Erling, had his cause been good. Olaf himself noticed Erling's behavior, and said to him, from the foredeck below, Thou hast turned against me to-day, Erling. The eagles fight breast to breast, answers he. This was a speech of the kings to Erling once long ago, while they stood fighting, not as now, but side by side. The king, with some transient thought of possibility going through his head, rejoins, Wilt thou surrender, Erling? That will I, answered he, took the helmet off his head, laid down sword and shield, and went forward to the forecastle deck. The king pricked, I think not very harshly, into Erling's chin or beard with the point of his battle-axe, saying, I must mark thee as traitor to thy sovereign, so. Whereupon one of the bystanders, Aslak Fityaskale, stupidly and fiercely burst up, smote Erling on the head with his axe, so that it struck fast in his brain, and was instantly the death of Erling. "'Ill luck attend thee for that stroke! Thou hast struck Norway out of my hand by it!' cried the king to Aslak, but forgave the poor fellow, who had done it meaning well. The insurrectionary bonder fleet, arriving soon after, as if for certain victory, was struck with astonishment at this Erling catastrophe and, being now without any leader of authority, made not the least attempt of battle, but, full of discouragement and consternation, thankfully allowed Olaf to sail away on his northward voyage, at discretion, and themselves went off lamenting with Erling's dead body. This small victory was the last that Olaf had over his many enemies at present. He sailed along still northward day after day, Several important people joined him, but the news from landward grew daily more ominous. Bonders busily arming to rear of him, and ahead, Hakon still more busily at Trondheim, now near by, and he will end thy days, king, if he have strength enough. Olaf paused, sent scouts to a hilltop. Hakon's armament visible enough, and underway hitherward about the isle of Bjarno yonder. Soon after, Olaf himself saw the bonder armament of twenty-five ships from the southward sail past in the distance to join that of Hakon, and worse still, his own ships, one and another, seven in all, 
were slipping off on a like errand. He made for the fjord of Fodrar, mouth of the rugged strath called Valdal, which I think still knows Olaf and has now an Olaf's highway, where, nine centuries ago, it scarcely had a path. Olaf entered this fjord, had his land tent set up, and a cross beside it, on the small level green behind the promontory there. Finding that his twelve poor ships were now reduced to five, against a world all risen upon him, he could not but see and admit to himself that there was no chance left, and that he must withdraw across the mountains and wait for a better time. His journey through that wild country, in these forlorn and straitened circumstances, has a mournful dignity and homely pathos, as described by Snorro, how he drew up his five poor ships upon the beach, packed all their furniture away, and with his hundred or so of attendants and their journey baggage, under guidance of some friendly bonder, rode up into the desert and foot of the mountains, scaled after three days' effort, as if by miracle, thought his attendants and thought Snorro, the well-nigh precipitous slopes that led across, never without miraculous aid from heaven, and all of good baggage wagons have ascended that pass. In short, have he fared along, beset by difficulties and the mournfulness thoughts, but patiently persisted, steadfastly trusted in God, and was fixed to return, and by God's help try again. An evidently very pious and devout man, a good man struggling with adversity, such as the gods, we may still imagine with the ancients, do look down upon as their noblest sight. He got to Sweden to the court of his brother-in-law, kindly and nobly enough received there, so gradually, perhaps, ill-seen by the now authorities of Norway. So that, before long, he quitted Sweden, left his queen there with her only daughter, his and hers, the only child they had, he himself had an only son, by a bondwoman, Magnus by name, who came to great things afterwards, of whom, and of which, by and by. With this bright little boy and a selected escort of attendants, he moved away to Russia, to King Jaroslav, where he might wait secure against all risk of hurting kind friends by his presence. He seems to have been an exile altogether some two years, such is one's vague notion, for there is no chronology in Snorro or his sagas, and one is reduced of guessing and inferring. He had reigned over Norway, reckoning from the first days of his landing there, to those last of his leaving it across the Dovrefjeld, about fifteen years, ten of them shiningly victorious. The news from Norway were naturally agitating to King Olaf, and, in the fluctuation of events there, his purposes and prospects varied much. He sometimes thought of pilgriming to Jerusalem, and a henceforth exclusively religious life, but for most part his pious thoughts themselves gravitated towards Norway, and a stroke for his old place and task there, which he steadily considered to have been committed to him by God. Norway, by the rumors, was evidently not at rest. Jarl Hakon, under the high patronage of his uncle, had lasted there but a little while. I know not that his government was especially unpopular, nor whether he himself much remembered his broken oath. It appears, however, he had left in England a beautiful bride, and considering farther that in England only could bridal ornaments and other wedding outfit of a sufficiently royal kind be found, he set sail thither to fetch her and them himself. One evening of wildish-looking weather he was seen about the northeast corner of the Pentland Friss. The night rose to be tempestuous. Hakon or any timber of his fleet was never seen more. Had all gone down, broken oaths, bridal hopes, and all else, mouse and man, into the roaring waters. There was no further opposition line, the like of which had lasted ever since old heathen Hakon Jarl, down to this his grandson Hakon's finis in the Pentland Friss. With this Hakon's disappearance it now disappeared. Indeed Knut himself, though of an empire suddenly so great, was but a temporary phenomenon. Fate had decided that the grand and wise Knut was to be short-lived, and to leave nothing as successors but an ineffectual youth Harald Herefoot, who soon perished, and a still stupider fiercely drinking Harda Knut, who rushed down of apoplexy, here in London city, as I guess, with the goblet at his mouth, drinking health and happiness at a wedding feast, also before long. 
Hakon having vanished in this dark way, there ensued a pause, both on Knut's part and on Norway's. Pause or interregnum of some months, till it became certain, first, whether Hakon were actually dead, secondly, till Norway, and especially till King Knut himself, could decide what to do. Knut, to the deep disappointment which had to keep itself silent, of three or four chief Norway men, named none of the three, or four jar of Norway, but besought him of a certain Swain, a bastard son of his own, who, and almost still more his English mother, much desired a carrier in the world fitter for him, sought they indignantly, than that of Captain over Jomsburg, where alone the father had been able to provide for him hitherto. Svein was sent to Norway as king, or vice-king, for father Knut, and along with him his fond and vehement mother, neither of whom gained any favor from the Norse people by the kind of management they ultimately came to show. Olaf, who news of this change, and such uncertainty, prevailing everywhere in Norway, as to the future course of things, whether Svein would come, as was rumored of at last, and be able to maintain himself if he did, thought there might be something on it of a chance for himself and his rights. And, after lengthened hesitation, much prayer, pious invocation and consideration, decided to go and try it. The final crane that had turned the balance, it appears, was a whole waking morning dream, or almost ocular vision he had of his glorious cousin Olaf Trugveson, who severely admonished, exhorted, and encouraged him, and disappeared grandly, just in the instant of Olaf's awakening, so that Olaf almost fancied he had seen the very figure of him as it melted into air. Let us on, let us on, thought Olaf always after that. He left his son, not in Russia, but in Sweden with the queen, who proved very good and carefully helpful in wise ways to him. In Russia Olaf had now nothing more to do but give his grateful adieus and get ready. His march towards Sweden, and from that towards Norway, and the passes of the mountains, down Borodal towards Stixelstad, and the crisis that awaited, is beautifully depicted by Snorro. It has, all of it, the description and we see clearly, the fact itself had, a kind of pathetic grandeur, simplicity, and rude nobleness, something epic or Homeric, without the meter or the singing of Homer, but with all the sincerity, rugged truth to nature, and much more of piety, devoutness, reverence, for what is forever high in this universe, than meets us in those old Greek ballad mongers. Singularly visual all of it, too, brought home in every particular to one's imagination, so that it stands out almost as a thing one actually saw. Olaf had about three thousand men with him, gathered mostly as he fared along through Norway, four hundred raised by one Dag, a kinsman whom he had found in Sweden and persuaded to come with him, marched usually in a separate body, and were, or might have been, rather an important element. Learning that the bonders were all arming, especially in Trondheim country, Olaf streamed down towards them in the closest order he could. By no means very close, subsistence even for three thousand being difficult in such a country. His speech was almost always free and cheerful, though his thoughts always naturally were of a high and earnest, almost sacred tone, devout above all. Stickelstad, a small poor hamlet still standing he where the valley ends, was seen by Olaf, and tacitly by the bonders as well, to be the natural place for offering battle. There Olaf issued out from the hills one morning, drove himself up according to the best rules of Norse tactics, rules of little complexity, but perspicuously true to the facts. I think he had a clear open ground still rather raised above the plain in front, he could see how the Bonder army had not yet quite arrived, but was pouring forward in spontaneous rows or groups, copiously by every path. This was thought to be the biggest army that ever met in Norway. Certainly not much fewer than a hundred times a hundred men, according to Snorro. Great Bonders, several of them, small Bonders, very many. All of willing mind, animated with a hot sense of intolerable injuries. King Olaf had punished great and small with equal rigor, says Snorro, which appeared to be the chief people of the country too severe, 
and animosity rose to the highest when they lost relatives by the king's just sentence, although they were in reality guilty. He again would rather renounce his dignity than omit righteous judgment. The accusation against him of being stingy with his money was not just, for he was a most generous man towards his friends. But that alone was the cause of the discontent raised against him, that he appeared hard and severe in his retributions. Besides, King Knut offered large sums of money, and the great chiefs were corrupted by this, and by his offering them greater dignities than they had possessed before. On these grounds against the interrible man, great and small were now pouring along by every path. Olaf perceived it would still be some time before the Bonder army was in rank. His own Doug of Sweden, too, was not yet come up. He was to have the right banner, King Olaf's own being the middle or grand one, some other person the third or left banner. All which being perfectly ranked and settled, according to the best rules, and waiting only the arrival of Dag. Olaf bade his men sit down, and freshen themselves with a little rest. There were religious services gone through. A matin's worship, such as there have been few, sternly earnest to the heart of it, and deep as death and eternity, at least on Olaf's own part. For the rest Stormont sang a stave of the fiercest Celtic poetry that was in him. All the army straightway sang it in chorus with fiery mind. The bonder of the nearest farm came up to tell Olaf that he also wished to fight for him. Thanks to thee, but don't, said Olaf. Stay at home, rather that the wounded may have some shelter. To this bonder Olaf delivered all the money he had, with solemn order to lay out the whole of it in masses and prayers for the souls of such of his enemies as fell. Such of thy enemies, king? Yes, yeah, surely, said Olaf. My friends will all either conquer or go whither I also am going. At last the bonder army, too, was got ranked three commanders, one of them with a kind of loose chief command, having settled to take charge of it, and began to shake itself towards actual advance. Olaf, in the meanwhile, had laid his head on the knees of Finn Arneson, his trustiest man, and fallen fast asleep. Finn's brother, Kalf Arneson, once a warm friend of Olaf, was chief of the three commanders on the opposite side. Finn and he addressed angry speech to one another from the opposite ranks, when they came near enough. Finn, Seeing the enemy fairly approach, stirred Olaf from his sleep. "'Oh, why hast thou wakened me from such a dream?' said Olaf in a deeply solemn tone. "'What dream was it, then? asked Finn. "'I dreamed that there rose a ladder here reaching up to very heaven,' said Olaf. "'I had climbed and climbed, and got to the very last step, and should have entered there, had thou given me another moment.' King, I doubt thou are fay, but I do not quite like that dream. The actual fight began about one of the clock in the most bright last day of July, and was very fierce and hot, especially on the part of Olaf's men, who shook the others back a little, though fierce enough they too, and had Doug been on the ground, which he wasn't yet, it was thought victory might have been won. Soon after battle joined, the sky grew of a ghastly brass or copper color, darker and darker, till thick night involved all things, and did not clear away again till battle was near ending. Dag, with his four hundred, arrived in the darkness and made a furious charge, what was afterwards, in the speech of the people, called Dag's storm, which had nearly prevailed but could not quite, victory again inclining to the so vastly larger party. It is uncertain still how the matter would have gone, for Olaf himself was now fighting with his own hand, and doing deadly execution on his busiest enemies to right and to left. But one of these chief rebels, Thorer Hund, though to have learned magic from the Laplanders, whom he long traded with and made money by, mysteriously would not fall from Olaf's best strokes. Best strokes brought only dust from the enchanted deerskin coat of the fellow, to Olaf's surprise when another of the rebel chiefs rushed forward, struck Olaf with his battle-axe, a wild slashing wound, and miserably broke his thigh, so that he staggered or was supported back to the nearest stone, and there sat down, lamentably calling on God to help him in this bad hour. Another rebel of note, the name of him long memorable in Norway, 
slashed or stabbed Olaf a second time, as did then a third. Upon which the noble Olaf sank dead, and forever quitted this dog hole of a world, little worthy of such men as Olaf one sometimes thinks. But that too is a mistake, and even an important one, should we persist in it. With Olaf's death the sky cleared again. Battle now near done, ended with complete victory to the rebels, and next to no pursuit or result except the death of Olaf everybody hastening home, as soon as the big duel had decided itself. Olaf's body was secretly carried, after dark, to some outhouse on the farm near the spot, whither a poor blind beggar, creeping in for shelter that very evening, was miraculously restored to sight. And, truly with a notable, almost miraculous speed, the feelings of all Norway for King Olaf changed themselves, and were turned upside down, within a year, or almost within a day. Superlative example of extinctus amabitur idem, not all of the sick set any longer, but all of the blessed, or saint, now clearly in heaven, such the name and character of him, from that time to this. Two churches dedicated to him, out of four that once stood, stand in London at this moment. And the miracles that have been done there, not to speak of Norway and Christendom elsewhere, in his name, were numerous and great for long centuries afterwards. Visibly a saint Olaf ever since, and, indeed, in Bolandus or elsewhere, I have seldom met with better stuff to make a saint of, or a true world hero, in all good senses. Speaking of the London Olaf churches, I should have added that from one of these, the thrice-famous Tooley Street gets its name, where those three tailors, addressing Parliament and the universe, sublimely styled themselves, we the people of England, St. Olaf Street, St. Olly Street, Stooley Street, Tooley Street, such are the metamorphoses of human fame in the world. The battle day of Stickelstad, King Olaf's death day, is generally believed to have been Wednesday, July the 31st, 1033. But on investigation it turns out that there was no total eclipse of the sun visible in Norway that year, though three years before there was one, but on the 29th instead of the 31st so that the exact date still remains uncertain, Dahlman, the latest critic, inclining for 1030 and its indisputable eclipse. End of section 7, Early Kings of Norway, chapter 10。section 8 of Early Kings of Norway this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine. Early Kings of Norway by Thomas Carlyle. Section 8. Chapter 11. Magnus the Good and Others. St. Olaf is the highest of these Norway kings, and is the last that much attracts us. For this reason, if a reason were not superfluous, we might here end our poor reminiscences of those dim sovereigns. But we will, nevertheless, for the sake of their connection with bits of English history, still hastily mention the names of one or two who follow, and who throw a momentary gleam of life and illumination on events and epochs that have fallen so extinct among ourselves at present, though once they were so momentous and memorable. The new king Svein from Jomsburg, Knut's natural son, had no success in Norway, nor seems to have deserved any. His English mother and he were found to be grasping, oppressive persons, and awoke almost from the instant that Olaf was suppressed and crushed away from Norway into heaven, universal odium more and more in that country. Well deservedly as still appears, for their taxings and extortions of malt, of herring, of meal, Smith's work and every article taxable in Norway were extreme, and their service to the country otherwise nearly imperceptible. In brief, their one basis there was the power of Knut the Great, and that, like all earthly things, was liable to sudden collapse, and it suffered much in notable degree. King Knut, hardly yet of middle age, and the greatest king in the then world, 
died at Shaftesbury in 1035, as Dalman thinks, leaving two legitimate sons and a busy, intriguing widow, Norman Emma, widow of Ethelred the Unready, mother of the younger of these two, neither of whom proved to have any talent or any continuance. In spite of Emma's utmost efforts, Harold, the elder son of Knut, not hers, got England for his kingdom. Emma and her harder Knut had to be content with Denmark and go thither, much against their will. Harold in England, light-going little figure like his father before him, got the name of Herefoot here, and might have done good work among his now orderly and settled people, but he died almost within a year and day, and has left no trace among us, except that of Harefoot, from his swift mood of walking. Emma and her Hardaknut now returned joyfully to England. But the violent, idle, and drunken Hardaknut did no good there, and happily for England and him, soon suddenly ended by a stroke of apoplexy at a marriage festival, as mentioned above. In Denmark he had done still less good, and indeed, under him, in a year or two, the grand imperial edifice, laboriously built by Knut's valor and wisdom, had already tumbled out to the ground, in a most unexpected and remarkable way, as we are now to indicate with all brevity. Swain's tyrannies in Norway had wrought such fruit that, within the four years after Olaf's death, the chief men in Norway, the very slayers of King Olaf, Kalf Arneson at the head of them, met secretly once or twice, and unanimously agreed that Kalf Arneson must go to Sweden or to Russia itself, seek young Magnus, son of Olaf Holm, excellent Magnus to be king over all Norway and them, instead of this intolerable Svein, which was at once done, Magnus brought home in a kind of triumph, all Norway waiting for him. Intolerable Swain had already been rebelled against. Some years before this, a certain young Trygve out of Ireland, authentic son of Olaf Trygveson, and of that fine Irish princess who chose him in his low habiliments and low estate, and took him over to her own green island. This royal young Trygve Olafsson had invaded the usurper Swain in a fierce, valiant, and determined manner, and though with too small a party, showed excellent fight for some time, till Swain, zealously bestirring himself, managed to get him beaten and killed. But that was a couple of years ago. The party is still too small, not including one and all as now. Swain, without stroke of sword this time, moved off towards Denmark, never showing face in Norway again. His drunken brother, Hardaknut, received him brother-like, even gave him some territory to rule over and subsist upon. But he lived only a short while, was gone before Hardaknut himself, and we will mention him no more. Magnus was a fine, bright young fellow, and proved a valiant, wise, and a successful king, known among his people as Magnus the Good. He was only natural son of King Olaf, but that made little difference in those times and there. His strange-looking, unexpected Latin name he got in this way. Alfhild, his mother, a slave, through ill luck of war, though nobly born, was seen to be in a hopeful way, and it was known in the king's house how intimately Olaf was connected with that occurrence, and how much he loved this king's serving maid, as she was commonly designated. Alfhild was brought to bed late at night, and all the world, especially King Olaf, was asleep. Olaf's strict rule, then and always being, don't awaken me, seemingly a man sensitive about his sleep. The child was a boy, or of rather weakly aspect, no important person present, except Sigvat, the king's Icelandic scald, who happened to be still awake, and the bishop of Norway, who, I suppose, had been sent for in hurry. What is to be done, said the bishop? Here is an infant in pressing need of baptism, and we know not what the name is. Go, Sigvat, awaken the king, and ask. I dare not for my life, answered Sigvat. King's orders are rigorous on that point. But if the child die unbaptized, said the bishop, shuddering, too certain he and everybody, where the child would go in that case. I will myself give him a name, said Sigvat, with a desperate concentration of all his faculties. 
he shall be namesake of the greatest of mankind, Imperial Carolus Magnus. Let us call the infant Magnus. King Olaf on the morrow asked rather sharply how Sigvat had dared take such a liberty, but excused Sigvat, seeing what the perilous alternative was. And Magnus by such accident this boy was called, and he not another is the prime origin and introducer of that name Magnus, which occurs rather frequently, not among the Norman kings only, but by and by among the Danish and Swedish, and among the Scandinavian populations appears to be rather frequent to this day. Magnus, a youth of great spirit, whose own, and standing at his back, all Norway now was, immediately smote home on Denmark, desirous naturally of vengeance for what it had done to Norway, and the sacred kindred of Magnus. Denmark, its great Knut gun, and nothing but a drunken harder Knut, fugitive Swain and co, there in his stead, was become a weak, dislocated country. And Magnus plundered in it, burned it, beat it, as often as he pleased. Harder Knut struggling what he could to make resistance or reprisals, but never once getting any victory over Magnus. Magnus, I perceive, was, like his father, a skilful, as well as valiant fighter by sea and land. Magnus, with good battalions, and probably backed by immediate alliance with heaven and St. Olaf, as was then the general belief or surmise about him, could not easily be beaten. And the truth is, he never was, by Harda Knut or any other. Harda Knut's last transaction with him was, to make a firm peace and even family treaty sanctioned by all the grandees of both countries, who did indeed mainly themselves make it, their two kings assenting that there should be perpetual peace, and no thought of war more, between Denmark and Norway, and that, if either of the kings died childless while the other was reigning, the other should succeed him in both kingdoms. A magnificent arrangement, such as has several times been made in the world's history, but which, in this instance, what is very singular, took actual effect, drunken heart of Knut dying so speedily, and Magnus being the man he was. One would like to give the date of this remarkable treaty, but cannot with precision. Guess somewhere about 1040. Actual fruition of it came to Magnus beyond question in 1042, when Harda Knut drank that vessel bowl at the wedding in Lambeth and fell down dead, which in the Saxon Chronicle is dated 3rd June of that year. Magnus at once went to Denmark on hearing this event, was joyfully received by the headmen there, who indeed, with their fellows in Norway, had been main contrivers of the treaty, both countries longing for mutual peace, and the end of such incessant broils. Magnus was triumphantly received as king in Denmark. The only unfortunate thing was that Svein Estrithson, the exiled son of Ulf, Knut's brother-in-law, whom Knut, as we saw, had summarily killed twelve years before, emerged from his exile in Sweden in a flattering form and proposed that Magnus should make him Jarl of Denmark, and general administrator there, in his own stead. To which the sanguine Magnus, in spite of advice to the contrary, insisted on acceding. Too powerful a Jarl, said Einar Tamberskelver, the same Einar whose bow was heard to break in Olaf Tryggveson's last battle. Norway breaking from thy hand, king. Who had now become Magnus' chief man, and had long been among the highest chiefs in Norway. Too powerful a jarl, said Einar earnestly. But Magnus disregarded it, and a troublesome experience had to teach him that it was true. In about a year, crafty Svein, bringing ends to meet, got himself declared king of Denmark for his own behoof, instead of jarl of another's, and had to be beaten and driven out by Magnus. Beaten every year, but almost always returned next year, for a new beating. A most, though not altogether, having at length got one dreadful smashing down, and half killing, which held him quiet for a while, so long as Magnus lived. Nay, in the end, he made good his point, as if by mere patience in being beaten, and did become king himself, and progenitor of all the kings that followed. King Sven Estrichson, so called from Astrid or Estris, his mother, the great Knut's sister, daughter of Svein Forkbeard, by that amazing Sigrid the Proud, 
who burnt those two ineligible suitors of hers both at once, and got a switch on the face from Olaf Tryggveson, which proved the death of that high man. But all this fine fortune of the often beaten Esterson was posterior to Magnus' death, who never would have suffered it had he been alive. Magnus was a mighty fighter, a fiery man, very proud and positive, among other qualities, and had such luck as was never seen before. Luck invariably good, said everybody, never once was beaten, which proves, continued everybody, that his father Olaf and the miraculous power of heaven were with him always. Magnus, I believe, did put down a great deal of anarchy in those countries. One of his earliest enterprises was to abolish Jomsburg, and trample out that nest of pirates, which he managed so completely that Jomsburg remained a mere reminiscence thenceforth, and its place is not now known to any mortal. One perverse thing did at last turn up in the course of Magnus, a new claimant for the crown of Norway, and he a formidable person withal. This was Harold, half-brother of the late Saint Olaf, uncle or half-uncle, therefore, of Magnus himself, indisputable son of the saint's mother by Saint Olaf's stepfather, who was himself descendant straight from Harold Harfag. This new Harold was already much heard of in the world. As an ardent boy of fifteen he had fought at King Olaf's side at Stickelstad, would not be admonished by the saint to go away. Got smitten down there, not killed, was smuggled away that night from the field by friendly help, good cured of his wounds, forwarded to Russia, where he grew to man's estate under bright auspices and successes, fell in love with the Russian princess, but could not get her to wife, went off thereupon to Constantinople as Weyringer, life guardsman of the Greek Kaiser, became chief captain of the Weyringers, invincible champion of the poor Kaisers that then were, and filled all the East with the shine and noise of his exploits. An authentic wearing or bearing, such a surname we now have derived from those people, who were an important institution in those Greek countries for several ages. Wiring or lifeguard, consisting of Norsemen, with sometimes a few English among them. Harald had innumerable adventures, nearly always successful, think the scouts, gained a great deal of wealth, gold ornaments and gold coin, had even Queen Zoe, so they think, so falsely, enamored of him at one time, and was himself a scout of eminence, some of whose verses, by no means the worst of their kind, remain to this day. This character of boring much distinguishes Harold to me, the only wiringer of whom I could ever get the least biography, true or half true. It seems the Greek history books but indifferently correspond with these saga records, and scholars say there could have been no considerable romance between Zoe and him, Zoe at that date being sixty years of age. Harold's own lays say nothing of any Zoe, but are still full of longing for his Russian princess far away. At last, what with Zoe's, what with Greek perversities and perfidies, and troubles that could not fail, he determined on quitting Greece, packed up his immensities of wealth in sucking shape, and actually returned to Russia, where new honors and favors awaited him from old friends, and especially, if I mistake not, the hand of that adorable princess, crown of all his wishes for the time being. Before long, however, he decided further to look after his Norway royal heritages, and for that purpose sailed in force to the jarl of quasi-king of Denmark, the often-beaten Swain, who was now in Sweden on his usual winter exile after beating. Swain and he had evidently interests in common. Swain was charmed to see him, so one like glorious and renowned a man, with masses of money about him too. Swain did by and by become treacherous, and even attempted one night to assassinate Harold in his bed on board ship, but Harold, vigilant of Svein, and a man of quick and sure insight, had providently gone to sleep elsewhere, leaving a log instead of himself among the blankets, in which log next morning treacherous Sven's battle-axe was found deeply sticking, and could not be removed without difficulty. But this was after Harald and King Magnus himself bad began treating, with the fairest prospects, which this, 
of the Svein battle axe naturally tended to forward, as it altogether ended the other copartenary. Magnus, on first hearing of Beiringer Harald and his intentions, made instant equipment and determination to fight his uttermost against the same. But wise persons of influence round him, as did the like sort round Weiringer Harald, earnestly advised compromise and peaceable agreement, which soon after that of Sven's nocturnal battle axe was the course adopted, and to the joy of all parties did prove a successful solution. Magnus agreed to part his kingdom with Uncle Harald, Uncle parting his treasures, or uniting them with Magnus' poverty. Each was to be an independent king, but they were to govern in common, Magnus rather presiding. He, to sit, for example, in the high seat alone, King Harald opposite him in a seat not quite so high, though if a stranger king came on a visit, both the Norse kings were to sit in the high seat, with various other punctilious regulations, which the fiery Magnus was extremely strict with, rendering the mutual relation a very dangerous one. Had not both the kings been honest men, and Harald a much more prudent and tolerant one than Magnus. They on the wall never had any weighty quarrel, thanks now and then rather to Harald than to Magnus. Magnus, too, was very noble, and Harald, with his wide experience in greater lengths of years, carefully held his heat of temper well covered in. Prior to Uncle Harald's coming, Magnus had distinguished himself as a law-giver. His code of laws for the Trondheim province was considered a pretty piece of legislation, and in some sequent times got the name of Grey Goose, Gragas, one of the wonderfulest names ever given to a wise book. Some say it came from the grey color of the parchment, some give other incredible origins. The last guess I have heard is that the name merely denotes antiquity, the witty name in Norway for a man growing old having been, in those times, that he was now becoming a grey goose. Very fantastic indeed, certain, however, that Grey Goose is the name of that venerable law book. Nay, there is another still more famous, belonging to Iceland, and not far from a century younger, the Iceland Grey Goose. The Norway one is perhaps of date about 1037, the other of about 1118. Peace be with them both. Or, if anybody is inclined to such matters, let him go to Dalman, for the amplest information and such minuteness of detail, as might almost enable him to be an advocate, with silk gown, in any court, depending on these grey geese. Magnus did not live long. He had a dream one night of his father Olaf's coming to him in shining presence and announcing that a magnificent fortune and world great renown was now possible for him, but that perhaps it was his duty to refuse it, in which case his earthly life would be short. Which way wilt thou do, then? said the shining presence. Thou shalt decide for me, father, thou, not I, and told his uncle Harold on the morrow, adding that he thought he should now soon die, which proved to be the fact. The magnificent fortune, so questionable otherwise, has reference, no doubt, to the conquest of England, to which country Magnus, as rightful and actual king of Denmark, as well as undisputed heir, to drunken Hardaknut, by treaty long ago, had now some evident claim. The enterprise itself was reserved to the patient, gay, and prudent Uncle Harold, and to him it did prove fatal, and merely paved the way for another, luckier, not likelier. Svein Estrisson, always beaten during Magnus' life, by and by got an agreement from the prudent Harald to be king of Denmark. Then, and end these wearisome and ineffectual brabbles, Harald having other work to do. But in the autumn of 1066, Tosti, a younger son of our English Earl Godwin, came to Sven's court with a most important announcement, namely, that King Edward the Confessor, so called, was dead, and that Harald, as the English write it, his eldest brother would give him, Tosti, no sufficient share in the kingship which state of matters, if Sven would go ahead with him to ratify it, would be greatly to the advantage of Sven. Sven, taught by many beatings, was too wise for this proposal, refused Tosti, who indignantly stepped over into Norway, and proposed it to King Harald there. 
Swain really had acquired considerable teaching, I should guess, from his much beating and hard experience in the world. One finds him afterwards the esteemed friend of the famous historian Adam of Bremen, who reports various wise humanities and pleasant discoursings with Swain Estrichson. As for Harald Hardred, Harald the Hard or Severe, as he was now called, Tosti's proposal awakened in him all his old wiringer ambitious and cupidities into blazing vehemence. He zealously consented, and at once, with his whole strength, embarked in the adventure, fitted out two hundred ships and the biggest army he could carry in them, and sailed with Tosti towards the dangerous promised land, got into the tune and took booty, got into the Humber, thence into the Oath, easily subdued any opposition the official people of the or their populations could make, victoriously scattered these, victoriously took the city of York in a day, and even got himself homage there, king of Northumberland, as per covenant, Tosti proving honorable, Tosti and he going with faithful strict partnery, and all things looking prosperous and glorious, except only an important exception, that they learned for certain, English Harold was advancing with all his strength, and in a measurable space of hours, unless care was taken, would be in York himself. Harold and Tosti hastened off to seize the post of Stamford Bridge on Derwent River, six or seven miles east of York City, and there bar this dangerous advent. Their own ships lay not far off in Oast River, in case of the worst. The battle that ensued the next day, September the 20th, 1066, is forever memorable in English history. Snorro gives vividly enough his view of it from the Icelandic side. A ring of stalwart Norsemen, close-ranked with their steel tools in hand. English Harold's army, mostly cavalry, prancing and pricking all around, trying to find or make some opening in that ring. For a long time trying in vain, till at length, getting them enticed to burst out somewhere in pursuit, they quickly turned round, and quickly made an end of that matter. Snorro represents English Harold with the first party of these horse coming up, and, with preliminary salutations, asking if Tosti were there, and if Harold were, making generous proposals to Tosti, but, in regard to Harold and what share of England was to be his, answering Tosti with the words, Seven feet of English earth, or more if he require it, for a grave. Upon which Tosti, like an honorable man and co-partner, said, No, never, let us fight you rather till we all die. Who is this that spoke to you? inquired Harold, when the cavaliers had withdrawn. My brother Harold, answers Tosti, which looks rather like a saga, but may be historical after all. Snorro's history of the battle is intelligible only after you have premised to it, what he never hints at, that the scene was on the east side of the bridge, and of the Derwent, the great struggle for the bridge, one at last finds, was after the fall of Harold, and to the English chronicles said struggle, which was abundantly severe, is all they know of the battle. Enraged at that breaking loose of his steel ring of infantry, Norse Harold blazed up into true Norse fury, all the old wire-ringer and berserker rage awakening in him, sprang forth into the front of the fight, and mauled and cut and smashed down, on both hands of him, everything he met, irresistible by any horse or man, till an arrow cut him through the windpipe, and laid him low forever. That was the end of King Harald and of his workings in this world. The circumstance that he was a warring or barring, and had smitten to pieces so many, oriental cohorts or crowds, and had made low verses, kind of iron madrigals, to his Russian princess, and caught the fancy of questionable Greek queens, and had amazed such heaps of money, while poor nephew Magnus had only one gold ring, which had been his father's, and even his father's mother's, as Uncle Harald noticed, and nothing more whatever of that precious metal to combine with Harald's treasures. All this is new to me, naturally no hint of it in any English book, and lends some gleam of romantic splendor to that dim business of Stamford Bridge, now fallen so dull and torpid to most English minds, transcendently important as it once was to all Englishmen. Adam of Bremen says, 
the English got as much gold plunder from Harald's people as was a heavy burden for twelve men. A thing evidently impossible, which nobody need try to believe. Young Olaf, Harald's son, age about sixteen, steering down the oaths at the top of his speed, escaped home to Norway with all his ships, and subsequently reigned there with Magnus, his brother. Harald's body did lie in English earth for about a year, but was then brought to Norway for burial. He needed more than seven feet of grave, say some. Laying, interpreting Snorro's measurements, makes Harald eight feet in stature. I do hope with some error in excess. End of section 8 Early Kings of Norway Chapter 119 of Early Kings of Norway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Early Kings of Norway by Thomas Carlyle. Section 9. Chapters 12 and 13. Chapter 12. Olaf the Tranquil, Magnus Barefoot, and Sigurd the Crusader. The new King Olaf, his brother Magnus having soon died, bore rule in Norway for some five-and-twenty years. Rule soft and gentle, not like his father's, and inclining rather to improvement in the arts and elegancies than to anything severe or dangerously laborious. A slim-built, witty-talking, popular and pretty man, with uncommonly bright eyes, and hair like floss silk, they called him Olaf Kier, the tranquil or easy-going. The ceremonials of the palace were much improved by him. Palace still continued to be built of huge logs pyramidically sloping upwards, with fireplace in the middle of the floor, and no egress for smoke or ingress for light except overhead, which in bad weather you could shut, or all but shut, with a lid. Lid originally made of mere opaque board, but changed latterly into a light frame, covered, glazed, so to speak, with entrails of animals, clarified into something of pellucidity. All this, Olaf, I hope, further perfected, as he did the placing of the court ladies, court officials, and the like, but I doubt if the luxury of a glass window were ever known to him, or a cup to drink from that was not made of metal or horn. In fact, it is chiefly for his son's sake I mention him here, and with the son, too, I have little real concern, but only a kind of fantastic. This son bears the name of Magnus Barfoot, barefoot or bare leg, and if you ask why so, the answer is, he was used to appear in the streets of Nidaros, Trondheim, now and then in complete Scotch Highland dress. Authentic tartan plaid and filibeg, at that epoch, to the wonder of Trondheim and us. The truth is, he had a mighty fancy for those Hebrides and other Scotch possessions of his, and seeing England now quite impossible, eagerly speculated on some conquest in Ireland as next best. He did, in fact, go diligently voyaging and inspecting among those Orkney and Hebridean isles, putting everything straight there, appointing stringent authorities, jarls, nay, a king, kingdom of the Suderor, southern isles, now called Sodor, and, as first king, Sigurd, his pretty little boy of nine years. All which done, and some quarrel with Sweden fought out, he seriously applied himself to visiting in a more emphatic manner namely, to invading, with his best skill and strength, the considerable virtual or actual kingdom he had in Ireland, intending fully to enlarge it to the utmost limits of the island, if possible. He got prosperously into Dublin, guess A.D. 1102, considerable authority he already had, even among those poor Irish kings, or kinglets, in their glibs and yellow saffron gowns, still more, I suppose, among the numerous Norse principalities there. King Murdoch, King of Ireland, says the Chronicle of Man, had obliged himself, every Yule day, to take a pair of shoes, hang them over his shoulder, as your servant does on a journey, and walk across his court, at bidding and in presence of Magnus Barefoot's messenger, by way of homage to the said king. Murdoch, on this greater occasion, did whatever homage could be required of him, but that, though comfortable, was far from satisfying the great king's ambitious mind. The great king left Murdoch, left his own Dublin, marched off westward on a general conquest of Ireland. 
marched easily victorious for a time, and got, some say, into the wilds of Connaught, but there saw himself beset by ambuscades and wild Irish countenances intent on mischief, and had, on the sudden, to draw up for battle, place, I regret to say, altogether undiscoverable to me, known only that it was boggy in the extreme. Certain enough, too certain and evident, Magnus Barefoot, searching eagerly, could find no firm footing there, nor, fighting furiously up to the knees or deeper, any result but honourable death. Date is confidently marked, 24th August, 1103, as if people knew the very day of the month. The natives did humanely give King Magnus Christian burial. The remnants of his force, without further molestation, found their ships on the coast of Ulster, and sailed home, without conquest of Ireland, nay, perhaps, leaving Royal Murdoch disposed to be relieved of his procession with the pair of shoes. Magnus Barefoot left three sons, all kings at once, reigning peaceably together. But to us at present the only noteworthy one of them was Sigurd, who, finding nothing special to do at home, left his brothers to manage for him, and went off on a far voyage, which has rendered him distinguishable in the crowd. Voyage, through the Straits of Gibraltar, on to Jerusalem, thence to Constantinople, and so home through Russia, shining with such renown as filled all Norway for the time being. A king called Sigurd Jorosvar, Jerusalemer, or Sigurd the Crusader, henceforth. His voyage had been only partially of the Viking type. In general it was of the royal progress kind, rather, Vikingism only intervening in cases of incivility or the like. His reception in the courts of Portugal, Spain, Sicily, and Italy, had been honourable and sumptuous. The king of Jerusalem broke out into utmost splendour and effusion at sight of such a pilgrim, and Constantinople did its highest honours to such a prince of Veringers. And the truth is, Sigurd intrinsically was a wise, able, and prudent man, who, surviving both his brothers, reigned a good while alone in a solid and successful way. He shows features of an original, independent-thinking man, something of ruggedly strong, sincere, and honest, with peculiarities that are amiable and even pathetic in the character and temperament of him, as, certainly, the course of life he took was of his own choosing, and peculiar enough. He happens, furthermore, to be, what he least of all could have chosen or expected, the last of the Harfager genealogy that had any success, or much deserved any, in this world. The last of the Harfagers, or as good as the last, so that, singular to say, it is in reality, for one thing only, that Sigurd, after all his crusadings and wonderful adventures, is memorable to us here. The advent of an Irish gentleman called Gilchrist, Gilchrist, servant of Christ, who, not over-welcome, I should think, but unconsciously big with the above result, appeared in Norway, while King Sigurd was supreme. Let us explain a little. This Gilchrist, the unconsciously fatal individual, who spoke Norse imperfectly, declared himself to be the natural son of Willem Magnus Barefoot, born to him there while engaged in that unfortunate conquest of Ireland. "'Here is my mother come with me,' said Gilchrist, who declares my real baptismal name to have been Harold, given me by that great king, and who will carry the red-hot plowshares, or do any reasonable ordeal in testimony of these facts. I am King Sigurd's veritable half-brother. What will King Sigurd think it fair to do with me? Sigurd clearly seems to have believed the man was speaking the truth, and indeed nobody to have doubted but he was. Sigurd said, Honourable sustenance shalt thou have from me here, but under pain of extirpation swear that, neither in my time nor in that of my young son Magnus, wilt thou ever claim any share in this government. Gil swore, and punctually kept his promise during Sigurd's reign. But during Magnus's he conspicuously broke it, and in result, through many reigns, and during three or four generations afterwards, produced unspeakable contentions, massacrings, confusions in the country he had adopted. There are reckoned, from the time of Sigurd's death, A.D. 1130, about a hundred years of civil war, no king allowed to distinguish himself by a solid reign of well-doing, or by any continuing reign at all, sometimes as many as four kings simultaneously fighting, and in Norway, from sire to son, nothing but sanguinary anarchy, disaster, and bewilderment, a country seeking steadily as if towards absolute ruin." 
of all of which frightful misery and discord Irish Gill, styled afterwards King Harold Gill, was, by ill destiny and otherwise, the visible origin, an illegitimate Irish Harfagar, who proved to be his own destruction, and that of the Harfagar kindred altogether. Sigurd himself seems always to have rather favoured Gill, who was a cheerful, shrewd, patient, witty, and effective fellow, and had, at first, much quizzing to endure, from the younger kind, on account of his Irish way of speaking Norse, and for other reasons. One evening, for example, while the drink was going round, Gill mentioned that the Irish had a wonderful talent of swift running, and that there were among them people who could keep up with the swiftest horse. At which, especially from young Magnus, there were peals of laughter, and a declaration from the latter that Gill and he would have tried it to-morrow morning. Gill in vain urged that he had not himself professed to be so swift a runner as to keep up with the prince's horses, but only that there were men in Ireland who could. Magnus was positive, and early next morning Gill had to be on the ground, and the race, naturally under heavy bet, actually went off. Gill started parallel to Magnus's stirrup, ran like a very row, and was clearly ahead at the goal. Unfair, said Magnus, thou must have had a hold of my stirrup leather, and helped thyself along. We must try it again. Gill ran behind the horse this second time, and then at the end sprang forward, and again was fairly in ahead. Thou must have held by the tail, said Magnus, not by fair running. Was this possible? We must try a third time. Gill started ahead of Magnus and his horse this third time, kept ahead with increasing distance, Magnus galloping his very best, and reached the goal more palpably foremost than ever. So that Magnus had to pay his bet, and other damage and humiliation, and got from his father, who heard of it soon afterwards, scoffing rebuke as a silly fellow, who did not know the worth of men, but only the clothes and rank of them, and well deserved what he had got from Gill. All the time King Sigurd lived, Gill seems to have had good recognition and protection from that famous man, and indeed to have gained favour all around, by his quiet social demeanour and the qualities he showed. CHAPTER Thirteen, MAGNUS THE BLIND, HAROLD GILL, AND MUTUAL EXTINCTION OF THE Harfagers. On Sigurd the Crusader's death, Magnus naturally came to the throne, Gill keeping silence and a cheerful face for the time. But it was not long till claim arose on Gill's part, till war and fight arose between Magnus and him, till the skilful, popular, ever active, and shifty Gill had entirely beaten Magnus, put out his eyes, mutilated the poor body of him in a horrible and unnamed manner, and shut him up in a convent as out of the game henceforth. There, in his dark misery, Magnus lived now as a monk, called Magnus the Blind by those Norse populations, King Harold Gill reigning victoriously in his stead. But this also was only for a time. There arose avenging kinsfolk of Magnus, who had no Irish accent in their Norse, and were themselves eager enough to bear rule in their native country. By one of these, a terribly strong-handed, fighting, violent, and regardless fellow, who was also a bastard of Magnus Barefoot's, and had been made a priest, but liked it unbearably ill, and had broken loose from it into the wildest courses at home and abroad, so that his current name got to be Slimby Deacon, or Slim and Ill Deacon, under which he is much noised of in Snorro and the Sagas. By this Slim Deacon, Gill was put an end to, murdered by night, drunk in his sleep, and poor blind Magnus was brought out, and again set to act as king, or king's cloak, in hopes Gill's posterity would never rise to victory more. But Gill's posterity did, to victory and also to defeat, and were the death of Magnus and of Slim Deacon too, in a frightful way, and all got their own death by and by in a ditto. In brief, these two kindreds, reckoned to be authentic enough, Harfager people, both kinds of them, proved now to have become a veritable crop of dragon's teeth, who mutually fought, plotted, struggled, as if it had been their life's business, never ended fighting, and seldom long intermitted it, till they had exterminated one another, and did at last all rest in death. One of these later Gill temporary kings I remember by the name of Harold Herdbred, Harold of the Broad Shoulders. The very last of them, I think, was Harold Mund, Harold of the Wrymouth, who gave rise to two impostors, 
pretending to be sons of his, a good while after the poor Rye Mouth itself and all its troublesome belongings were quietly underground. What Norway suffered during that sad century may be imagined. End of section 9. Early Kings of Norway. Chapters 12 and 13. of early kings of norway this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org early kings of norway by thomas carlyle section 10 chapters 14 15 and 16 chapter 14 sverer and descendants to hack on the old the end of it was or rather the first abatement and beginnings of the end that when all this had gone on ever worsening for some forty years or so, one's fairer, A.D. 1177, at the head of an armed mob of poor people called Birkebeins, came upon the scene. A strange enough figure in history, this fairer and his Birkebeins. At first a mere mockery and dismal laughing-stock to the enlightened Norway public. Nevertheless, by unheard-of fighting, hungering, exertion, and endurance, Sverer, after ten years of such a death-wrestle against men and things, got himself accepted as king, and by wonderful expenditure of ingenuity, common cunning, unctuous parliamentary eloquence, or almost popular preaching, and it must be owned, general human faculty and valor, or value, in the overclouded and distorted state, did victoriously continue such and founded a new dynasty in Norway, which ended only with Norway's separate existence, after near three hundred years. This Sverer called himself a son of Harold Rymouth, but was in reality the son of a poor comb-maker in some little town of Norway, nothing heard of sonship to Rymouth till after good success otherwise. His Birkebeins, that is to say, birch-legs, the poor rebellious wretches having taken to the woods, and been obliged, besides their intolerable scarcity of food, to thatch their bodies from the cold with whatever covering could be got, and their legs especially with birch-bark, sad species of fleecy hosiery, whence their nickname, his Birkebeins I guess always to have been a kind of Norse jackery, desperate rising of thralls and indigent people, driven mad by their unendurable sufferings and famishings, there's the deepest stratum of misery, and the densest and heaviest, in this general misery of Norway, which had lasted towards the third generation, and looked as if it would last for ever, whereupon they had risen proclaiming in this famous dumb manner, unintelligible except to heaven, that the same could not, nor would not, be endured any longer. And, by their sphearer, strange to say, they did attain a kind of permanent success, and, from being a dismal laughing-stock in Norway, came to be important, and, for a time, all important there. Their opposition nicknames, Baglers, from Bagal, Bacalus, Bishop Staff, Bishop Nicholas being chief leader, Gold Legs, and the like obscure terms, for there was still a considerable course of counterfighting ahead, and especially of counter-nicknaming, I take to have meant in Norse prefigurement seven centuries ago, bloated aristocracy, tyrannous bourgeoisie, till in the next century these rents were closed again. King Sverer, not himself bred to comb-making, had, in his fifth year, gone to an uncle, bishop in the Faroe Islands, and got some considerable education from him, with a view to priesthood on the part of Sverer. But, not liking that career, Sverer had fled and smuggled himself over to the Birkebeins, who, noticing the learned tongue and other miraculous qualities of the man, proposed to make him captain of them, and even threatened to kill him if he would not accept, which, thus, at the sword's point, as Ferrer says, he was obliged to do. It was after this that he thought of becoming son of Rymouth and other high things. His Birkebeins and he certainly had a talent of campaigning which has hardly ever been equalled. They fought like devils against any odds of number, and before battle they have been known to march six days together without food, except, perhaps, the inner barks of trees, and in such clothing and shoeing as mere birch-bark. At one time, somewhere in the Dover field, there was serious counsel held among them whether they should not all, as one man, leap down into the frozen gulfs and precipices, or at once massacre one another wholly, and so finish. Of their conduct in battle, fiercer than that of Beresarks, where was there ever seen the parallel? 
In truth, they are a dim, strange object to me, in that black time, wondrously bringing light into it withal, and proved to be, under such unexpected circumstances, the beginning of better days. Of Sverer's public speeches there still exist authentic specimens, wonderful indeed, and much characteristic of such a Sverer. A comb-maker king, evidently meaning several good and solid things, and affecting them too, athwart such an element of Norwegian chaos come again. His descendants and successors were a comparatively respectable kin. The last and greatest of them I shall mention is Hakon the Seventh, or Hakon the Old, whose fame is still lively among us, from the Battle of Largs at least. Chapter 15. Hakon the Old at Largs. In the Norse annals our famous Battle of Largs makes small figure, or almost none at all, among Hakon's battles and feats. They do say, indeed, those Norse annalists, that the King of Scotland, Alexander the Third, who had such a fate among the crags about Kinghorn in time coming, was very anxious to purchase from King Hakon his sovereignty of the Western Isles, but that Hakon pointedly refused, and at length, being again importuned and bothered on the business, decided on giving a refusal that could not be mistaken. Decided, namely, to go with the big expedition, and look thoroughly into that wing of his dominions, where no doubt much has fallen awry since Magnus Barefoot's grand visit thither, and seems to be inviting the cupidity of bad neighbors. All this we will put right again, thinks Hakon, and gird it up into a safe and defensive posture, adjusting and rectifying among his Hebrides as he went along, and landing withal on the Scotch coast to plunder and punish as he thought fit. The Scots say he had claimed of them Aaron, Bute, and the two Cumbrays, given my ancestors by Donald Bain, said Hakon, to the amazement of the Scots, as a part of the Sudoro, Southern Isles, so far from selling that fine kingdom, and that it was, after the taking, both Aaron and Bute that he made his descent at Largs. Of Largs there is no mention, whatever, in Norse books. But beyond any doubt, such is the other evidence, Hakon did land there, land and fight, not conquering, probably rather beaten, and very certainly retiring to his ships, as in either case he behooved to do. It is further certain he was dreadfully maltreated by the weather on those wild coasts, and altogether creditable, as the Scotch records bear, that he was so at Largs very specially. The Norse records or sagas say merely he lost many of his ships by the tempests, and many of his men by landing fighting in various ports, tacitly including Largs, no doubt, which was the last of these misfortunes to him. In the battle here he lost fifteen thousand men, say the Scots, we five thousand. Divide these numbers by ten, and the excellently brief and lucid Scottish summary by Buchanan may be taken as the approximately true and exact. Date of the battle is A.D. 1263. To this day, on a little plain to the south of the village, now town, of Largs, in Ayrshire, there are seen stone carns and monumental heaps, and, until within a century ago, one huge, solitary, upright stone, still mutely testifying to a battle there, altogether clearly to this battle of King Hakon's, who, by the Norse records, too, was in these neighborhoods at that same date, and evidently in an aggressive, high kind of humor. For while his ships and army were doubling the mull of Cantire, he had his own boat set on wheels, and therein, splendidly enough, had himself drawn across the promontory at a flatter part, no doubt with horns sounding, banners waving. All to the left of me is mine in Norway's, exclaimed Hakon, in his triumphant boat progress, which such disasters soon followed. Hakon gathered his wrecks together, and sorrowfully made for Orkney. It is possible enough, as our guide-books now say, he may have gone by Ionia, Mull, and the narrow seas inside of Skye, and that the Kyle Aachen, favorably known to sea-bathers in that region, may actually mean the Kyle, narrow strait, of Hakon, where Hakon may have dropped anchor, and rested for a little while in smooth water and beautiful environment, safe from equinoctial storms. But poor Hakon's heart was now broken. He went to Orkney, died there in the winter, never beholding Norway more. He it was who got to Iceland, which had been a republic for four centuries, united to his kingdom of Norway, a long and intricate operation, much presided over by our Snorro Sturluson, so often quoted here, who indeed lost his life, by assassination from his sons-in-law, 
and out of great wealth sank at once into poverty of zero, one midnight in his own cellar, in the course of that bad business. Hakon was a great politician in his time, and succeeded in many things before he lost lards. Snorro's death by murder had happened about twenty years before Hakon's by broken heart. He is called Hakon the Old, though one finds his age was but fifty-nine, probably a longish life for a Norway king. Snorro's narrative ceases when Snorro himself was born, at the threshold of King Sverrir, of whose exploits and doubtful birth it is guessed by some that Snorro willingly forbore to speak in the hearing of such a Hakon. CHAPTER Sixteen, EPILOGUE Harfagr's kindred lasted some three centuries in Norway. Sverrir's lasted into its third century there. How long after this, among the neighboring kinships, I did not inquire, for, by regal affinities, consanguinities, and unexpected chances and changes, the three Scandinavian kingdoms fell all peaceably together under Queen Margaret, of the Kalmar Union, A.D. 1397, and Norway, incorporated now with Denmark, needed no more kings. The history of these Harfagers has awakened in me many thoughts, of despotism and democracy, arbitrary government by one and self-government, which means no government or anarchy by all, of dictatorship with many faults, and universal suffrage with little possibility of any virtue. For the contrast between Olaf Tryggvason and a universal suffrage parliament or an imperial copper captain has, in these nine centuries, grown to be very great. And the eternal providence that guides all this, and produces alike these entities with their epochs, is not its course still through the great deep? Does it not speak to us if we have ears? Here, clothed in stormy enough passage and instincts, unconscious of any aim but their own satisfaction, is the blessed beginning of human order, regulation, and real government. There, clothed in a highly different, but again suitable garniture of passions, instincts, and equally unconscious as to real aim, is the accursed-looking ending, temporary ending, of order, regulation, and government, very dismal to the sane onlooker for the time being, not dismal to him otherwise, his hope, too, being steadfast. But here, at any rate, in this poor Norse theatre, one looks with interest on the first transformation, so mysterious and abstruse, of human chaos into something of articulate cosmos, witnesses the wild and strange birth-pangs of human society, and reflects that without something similar, little as men expect such now, no cosmos of human society ever was got into existence, nor can ever again be. The violences, fightings, crimes, ah, yes, these seldom fail, and they are very lamentable. But always, too, among those old populations, there was one saving element, the now want of which, especially the unlamented want, transcends all lamentation. Here is one of these strange, piercing, winged words of Ruskin, which has in it a terrible truth for us in these epochs now come. My friends, the follies of modern liberalism, many and great though they be, are practically summed in this denial or neglect of the quality and intrinsic value of things. Its rectangular beatitudes and spherical benevolences, theology of universal indulgence, and jurisprudence which will hang no rogues, mean, one and all of them, in the root, incapacity of discerning, or refusal to discern, worth and unworth in anything, and least of all in man. Whereas nature and heaven command you, at your peril, to discern worth from unworth in everything, and most of all in man. Your main problem is that ancient and trite one, who is best man? And the fates forgive much, forgive the wildest, fiercest, cruelest experiments, if fairly made for the determination of that. Theft and blood-guiltiness are not pleasing in their sight. Yet the favoring powers of the spiritual and material world will confirm to you your stolen goods, and their noblest voices will applaud the lifting of your spear, and rehearse the sculpture of your shield, if only your robbing and slaying have been in fair arbitrament of that question, who is best man? But if you refuse such an inquiry, and maintain every man for his neighbor's match, if you give vote to the simple and liberty to the vile, the powers of those spiritual and material worlds in due time present you inevitably with the same problem, soluble now only wrong side upwards, and your robbing and slaying must be done then to find out 
who is worst man, which, in so wide an order of merit, is indeed not easy, but a complete Tammany ring, and lowest circle in the inferno of worst, you are sure to find, and be governed by. All readers will admit that there was something naturally royal in these Harfager kings. A wildly great kind of kindred counts in it two heroes of a high, or almost highest, type, the first two Olafs, Trigvison and the Saint. And the view of them withal, as we chance to have it, I have often thought, how essentially Homeric it was. Indeed, what is Homer himself but the rhapsody of five centuries of Greek skalds and wandering ballad-singers, done, i.e., stitched together, by somebody more musical than Snorro was. Olaf Trigvison and Olaf Saint pleased me quite as well in their prosaic form, offering me the truth of them as if seen in their real lineaments by some marvellous opening, through the art of Snorro, across the black strata of the ages. Too high, almost among the highest sons of nature, seen as they veritably were, fairly comparable or superior to godlike Achilles, goddess-wounding Diomedes, much more to the two Atredi, regulators of the peoples. I have also thought often what a book might be made of Snorro, did there but arise a man furnished with due literary insight, and indefatigable diligence, who faithfully acquainting himself with the topography, the monumental relics, and illustrative actualities of Norway, carefully scanning the best testimonies as to place and time which that country can still give him, carefully the best collateral records and chronologies of other countries, and who, himself possessing the highest faculty of a poet, could, abridging, arranging, elucidating, reduce Snorro to a polished cosmic state, unweariedly purging away his much chaotic matter. A modern, highest kind of poet, capable of unlimited slavish labor withal, who I fear is not soon to be expected in this world, or likely to find his task in the Heimskringla if he did appear here. End of section 10, chapters 14, 15, and 16. End of Early Kings of Norway.